It is so brilliant to have you here, Lucy. Thank you so much for joining me. And I have to say, I'm particularly excited because um, I, I guess you get this a lot, but I'm a massive fan of Robot Wars. And over <laughs> lockdown, you kept me sane because um, I was watching lots of reruns of mm-hmm. Robot Wars. And then I grew up watching Robot Wars as well. And I have seen you um, speak as well. So you're a fantastic role model, I think, in the STEM community and everything. <laughs> so it's brilliant to have you here. And I know that you have a wealth of experience across inventing and engineering and public um, engagement, as we said, in STEM. So could you just give a bit of a, a brief overview about your journey from when you first kind of got excited about this stuff and and to where you are now? I've always been a maker. So I've always made things, be it you know, making a den in the woods or, or, or doing some embroidery with my mum. So there was that bit. And I loved going on play school through the round window when you went to a manufacturing firm and you saw how things were made. So making was always sort of there somehow. And when I was at school, I was doing my A-levels and the physics teacher set up a Great Egg Race Club. Now, this was a TV program from the 70s and 80s. And the premise was or started with you you were given an egg and you had to move it across the room as far as you could, just being powered by an elastic band. So it was sort of these these contraptions, weird contraptions, and then it, it evolved. And we had this club at school that did it. And one of the ones I remember doing was... Uh, Set off a party popper as far away as you can from, you know, from, 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 from as far away as you can. So I was up the other end of the lab and I had a, a little trolley that used to use a ticker tape t- t- timers. So it's a, a piece of wood with four wheels. And I sent it down this ramp and over by the teacher, I had set up and I'd put it to one side, but I'd set up my party popper and then the, the string went through the hole in the stool, you know, the science lab stools. And then there were some weights on it and I'd stuck some polystyrene cups up so that it, it just, it was just out of the way. But my trolley veered to the side and I'm going, Ooh, 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 it hit the stool. The, the, um, the polystyrene cups went, the party popper went off in the face of the teacher who'd been doing his marking. He looked up and said, I think you should be an engineer, Lucy. <laughs> that's, that's when I really thought, well, what is this engineering? I don't quite know what it is. And I managed to get on um, a insight into engineering, a course for uh, girls, women in the sixth form to go to a university and spend a week to find out what engineering was. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I wanted to do marine engineering. I wanted boats. I wanted the seaside. And I realized that actually, if I did mechanical, it would be more generalist and I could go into many different areas. So that's where I, I started. And I did a degree in mechanical. Well, actually, I started with me- mechatronics, uh, which was electronics and mechanical, and actually hated the electronics, couldn't do the electronics and couldn't do the computing. So I just stuck with mechanical. And I ha- actually ended up with a, um, uh, I got a 2-1 degree in mechanical engineering, but I did a thick sandwich. So I was sponsored by what's now or what became Rolls-Royce Industrial Power Group. And I ended up on their graduate training scheme, which was really useful. So three months in purchasing, three months in sales, three months uh, on the shop floor, um, going all around. So I found lots of different bits and I found lots of bits that I didn't like at all. (laughs) Um, So when I'd I'd done that, um, I finished the degree. Mm -hmm. I went on and did a post-grad. So I did did some more time at the company. I did a postgrad course in design, manufacturer and management, um, and then came back and finished my graduate training scheme at Rolls-Royce. But at the time, Rolls-Royce was closing down the industrial power group. It was selling it off, a lot of redundancies. So I ended up finding myself another job um, working with a small company. Mm-hmm. And this was called, a, at the time it was called a teaching company scheme. I think it's now Knowledge Transfer Partnership. And they basically, they, they put young graduates into small companies to do some research that needs doing, but they haven't got the time or the finances to do it. And they said to me, if you write it up, you'll get a PhD. <laughs> so I wrote it up. I was looking at how bubbles are formed in firefighting equipment. Wow. So I had this piece of kit 
that they knew how it worked. Uh, they knew that it worked. They didn't know how it worked. So I ended up with a high-speed video camera um, back in the days when we were still VHS tape um, and, and found out how bubbles are made. So that was sort of a, my <laughs> a wow. potted history of my, uh, my education, really. Oh, that's, oh my goodness. That's incredible. <laughs> I love that. And I love the bubbles too. That's so cool. <laughs> so how did, where did it go from there then? Because of this, I love the, you can hear the passion there from quite a young age. And I also love that your teacher was the one who said to you as well, like you should be an engineer. And that's quite rare or from the conversations that I've had with women, it's been rare back in the day that a teacher would say to a woman, oh, you know, <laughs> you should be an engineer. So that's fantastic. It, I must admit it was a girls' school. Um, uh -huh. So that probably helped. It was a state school, but it, it was a girls' girls' grammar. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we were, we were only girls there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that actually, it was the same for me. And it was a similar experience because it, they have to. <laughs> <laughs> don't they they have to then yeah um so yeah where did it go from there after that did you go did you think okay I definitely want to be an engineer forever did you know what your path was no didn't know what the path was I thought I wanted to run a company um run an engineering company but I was hitting up against sexism so I'd, I'd hit up against it at Rolls-Royce, um, uh, where the senior engineer wouldn't let me go to the engineer's Christmas party because as far as he was concerned, women couldn't be engineers. Now, I suspect that was more to do with um, teasing me and wanting to have, say, a stripper or something at their Christmas party. I don't actually know. Mm. But at the time, because I'd gone to a girls' school, I didn't know sexism. I didn't know how to respond to sexism. And it, it, yeah. it really threw me. Um, but at the small company, they ended up, um, they wouldn't send me on site. And they said, oh, you're not experienced enough. You're not experienced enough. By this time, I was 25 chartered engineer, chartered wow. mechanical engineer. You're not experienced enough. Like, okay, fair point. I'm not experienced enough. But we'll send the 21-year-old boy grad straight out of university. Oh, my hmm. God. So I ended up leaving there. Yeah. And... Um, my partner at the time had just set up a computer consultancy. It was um, just gone Y2K. So the year 2000 millennium bug uh, mm -hmm. computer consultancy. And I went and worked with him for, it was going to be a couple of years. Um, it's be while, you know, get that sorted. And then I'll set up my own consultancy because now I'm chartered. I've got a little bit more respect. I can, I can do engineering consultancy. Um, sadly, that didn't quite work out as planned. Um, the computer consultancy was very, very lucrative, very lucrative. So much so that it was actually cost effective for me to effectively do nothing, do the bookkeeping um, and make sure that I kept the company running than it was for me to go out and set up my own company. So I sort of stagnated for 10 years in the end. Um, I hadn't, it wasn't in the plan at all whatsoever, but that's what happened. And I was doing other things in the time. I was um, ended up doing some voluntary work at a, a company that was making a rocket to go into space, like oh. you do. <laughs> um, and because of that, uh, the work I was doing there. And I knew an awful lot about this little bit that, you know, about this bit of the rocket. And I didn't mm. know how the rest of the rocket worked. And so I, I said, well, where's the books? And I said, well, mm. here's the kids' books that tell you, or here's the pile of books that tell you about that bit. Here's the pile of books that tell you about that bit. And here's the pile of books that tell you about that bit. And by mm. this stage, because I had been a little bit bored doing the computer consultancy, um, I had managed to get myself on a um, British Association for the Advancement of Science. They've renamed themselves now. But they were getting engineers uh, to go and work with the media so that the media would understand how engineers and scientists work and scientists and engineers would understand how the media work. So I managed to get a three-week, six-week placement at The Guardian newspaper. And discovered that I had a knack for turning science into plain English. And so from that and from the rocket stuff, I decided I'd write a book on rocket science in plain English. So I, I'd, I wrote the book that I wanted to read. Mm. Naivety is great. Six months, I thought. Three years later, 
<laughs> three, three years. years. Wow. Three <laughs> years. I mean, I was still doing the computer stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I finished the book and there was a lot of unknown unknowns in, mm. in writing the book because I didn't, I didn't know it well enough to write it. And then you have to really understand it to be able to explain it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where I went with that. And then, um, yes, I've now learnt a phrase that women marry their own glass ceilings. So uh, basically, I wasn't going to go anywhere because of who I was with and what I was doing. Um, and I'd realized this and I was stagnating and I knew it um, mm. and, and things weren't particularly great. So I ended up leaving that relationship. And then I was like, OK, now what do I do? Um, I haven't got the, the, the income coming in. Um, I had a, a, a nest egg, if you like, uh, to, to keep me going. Yeah. But I managed to get some writing work and I ended up writing a, uh, some of the course text for an MSc in environmental health, mm-hmm. uh, which had more engineering in than I was expecting. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff on uh, food preparation, which you get in, in, in food manufacturing places. Yeah. Um, there was a lot about pollution, yeah, a lot of things that we actually do in, and quality uh, that we do in engineering uh, was in this environmental health MSc. And from then I did a, another postgraduate course. It was called Singularity University mm-hmm. based over at NASA Ames in the States. Mm-hmm. And we were looking at all the exponential technologies. So the, for the first five weeks, and there were I think there was 85 students from 35 countries. It was really multinational. And they were teaching us about things like genomics and uh, the self-driving car was was new and novel then, um, artificial intelligence, 3D printing even. And then in the second five weeks, we were tasked with finding a big problem, a problem that um, or we were tasked with positively affect the lives of a billion people. Oh, so, so mm, okay, right. So I ended up working on space debris. Um, and when I finished that project, um, and I'd had to argue with, there was an astronaut who was a tutor on the course. I had to argue with him. He had done spacewalks. He said, space debris is not a problem. Space is big. You don't know how big space is. Space is big. And I didn't have the... Um, eloquence to actually argue with him at the time but I spammed him I spammed him (laughs) with so many links and articles things that NASA had written about space debris which I'd obviously found in the book when I wrote the book um that the next day he turned around in front of the whole university and said space debris is a problem Lucy's quite right on this (laughs) (laughs) which was it was a rather nice thing you know that did my confidence a lot of good yeah that's a huge Um, boost so I came back and I was working on space debris for a while. Um, and this was, yeah, back in the days when we didn't think it was, a, or general public didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. And I ended up being on the BBC Six O'Clock News, um, <laughs> talking about space debris and doing work for other um, space companies in the UK. But then I realised that the um, you really have to be part of a big company. You know, space debris is a big problem that I'm not going to solve on my own. And I had uh, the commitment of my dog. Um, so my, my dog, I didn't want to go out to work because I had a dog at home. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, other, other bits and pieces. And I realized, no, I don't really want to work for a big company. Um, I, I, I'd get swamped and yeah, I want to do stuff on my own. And about this time, the Raspberry Pi had come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started tinkering with the Raspberry Pi and the, um, I had plenty of friends on Twitter who could basically handhold and help me uh, mm. do this. And so I learned, then I learned the electronics and the computing that I didn't learn at university. Started because I learned how to write with working with The Guardian. I wrote them up as blogs and then people approached me, can you make videos? And so I began to do more and more presentation stuff mm-hmm. and sort of it's, it's how it all grew into what mm-hmm. I now do. Um, and I'm, I'm now doing that job that I wanted to do when I was 18 is making great egg race type contraptions <laughs> <laughs> whenever I want. This is this is this just blows my mind because there's so many kind of twists and turns to this with periods of, as you said, 
the word stagnation and kind of not knowing and then trying to figure it out. Because I think anybody who looks at you and where you're at now in your career, people just assume that these things just happen overnight. And, you know, you just knew that you wanted to turn into this person that you are and it was easy. Um, So how was it for you in those kind of moments where you didn't know what was happening and, and where you did feel stagnating, but how did you get out of that? Yes, it, it, I know it, it took me two years to get out of a, a 17 year relationship um, wow. because I thought, I know this is wrong. I know this is wrong. I know I yeah. couldn't, just couldn't do make that step. I know it's hard. Um, it didn't help. It was a controlling relationship as well. So it was yeah, all a bit difficult. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, I really feel for it. But because of that and because I realized that I had stagnated for, say, 10 years, I have put everything into the last 10 or so years. I have taken every opportunity since. Mm. So even though I still do every so often think, yeah, I'm not doing quite as much as I look back on the last few years. and Oh, no, I did that. Oh, no, I did that. Oh, I did that. Um, where I got that, I, I don't remember quite how, what the last straw was. I think I mm. made some, this must happen and this must happen. And, and if this doesn't, yeah, I'll go mm. for it. Um, but I know that I had a support network. I know there were a lot of people who were metaphorically putting down ropes to me in my pit. And I was saying, yeah, that, that's your rope, but I've just got to finish this. Or, but yeah, I can see your rope, but I've just got to finish whatever this was. Uh, it wasn't important, whatever that was. <laughs> um, and eventually when I made that move, I didn't, didn't climb up any of those ropes, but in my mind, I could see all those people around the top of my pit um, come on, come on, we'll give you a hand, come on. Uh, so that was, that was just lovely to know that I had that support uh, out there. And it's, your friends know <laughs> if you need to get out. And it's just a case of actually asking for help. And nowadays, I am much more forward at asking for help, mm-hmm. um, much more aware of, no, I'm in a pit, I need to do something about that. Or I'm heading towards a pit, mm-hmm. I need to do something about that. Um, so having the, that that awareness around it, I guess going through that means that now you know if you're heading towards a similar thing. Very again. much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, am am I not enjoying this because I'm not enjoying it because you know it's hard and I'll get there, or am I not enjoying this because it's actually no good? Mm. So yeah, trying all the things now. Um, yeah, I even tried ballet. Now I wasn't the ballet type at school. I, I was up climbing trees, laughing at the ballet girls. Mm. Um, but it was the only uh, keep fit that was on in my in my village. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to ballet. Loved it. You know, it, so it's a lot of that. Those stories that we tell ourselves. Mm. I can't. I'm not. It's like, mm. well, why not? Who told me that I'm not? Um, and then I can try it and say, oh, no, actually, no, I'm not. Or uh, no, no, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do know that one thing that has really given me the ability is that I still have some of that nest egg uh, from the computer days. Mm-hmm. And that helps a lot to know mm-hmm. that if I don't work for the next two months, it's OK. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and, and I realize what a privilege that is. Mm. that a lot of people don't have. And I haven't got responsibility, other than my dog, I haven't got responsibilities that I've got to, you know, if I eat baked beans for a month, I eat baked beans for a month. You know, it's, it's not um, the worst, th- it, you know, it's not going to harm anyone else, what yeah. I do. But it, so it, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky in that respect. Mm. But it still takes a lot of, of guts and courage to basically realize you're in a difficult place to get yourself out of it. And then to sh- you've almost like completely switched your mindset to a can do, will do, will try everything. And that in itself can be, diff- I know for myself, when I force myself to do things like stand up comedy, just to try and stretch my you know, confidence and my growth, even though I hate yeah. it. And it's like, oh goodness. And it's horrible and scary. So have you had those moments where something has terrified you and you've just had to do it? Often, often. <laughs> I, I know that the magic happens outside of my comfort zone. And it's a phrase that I picked up somewhere and I absolutely love it. Mm. 
So yes, the stand-up comedy. I was shaking like a leaf and um, I only had like 20 people in the room um, and I was shaking more than if I'd had 2,000 geeks in the room talking technology. Mm. But I'd also realized that um, one of my, one of the threads was uh, seven, eight years ago, I was lecturing electronics. Uh, and this was in the stage where I was still learning the electronics. So I was half a page ahead of the students. Um, but I was boring myself. I was so boring or I was so bored. I was thinking, why? And I realized um, I, I went along to public speaking club, uh, Toast, Toastmasters, it's called, to, to get myself better because I, I can't stand up in front of these students for another two hours and bore myself because you know, what are the poor students going to think? Or, you know, how are they going to learn anything if I'm so boring? Um, and I, it turned out I was taking my personality out of my talks. I thought professional meant um, just the facts. And mm. by putting my personality back in, which I am inclined to put humor in, yeah. um, then, then it, was, it became better <laughs> and better over time. Yeah. But one of the things I, I did recently... Um, during lockdown, I was given a slack line. So mm -hmm. it's uh, like a, a tightrope, thick uh, webbing, and you, you string it up and then you, you walk on it like a tightrope. And I'd been meaning to do it, meaning to do it. And I thought, oh, I can't do it in lockdown because the hospitals are already um, stretched. And what if I fall off and break my leg? And what if this? And what if that? And I tried it uh, once before and I just wobble. You know, I stayed on for a second and wobbled. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to try anything if I have this, I am too scared to mentality. Mm -hmm. So I did the engineering thing and I did a huge risk analysis of, mm -hmm. okay, well, where can I put this, this slack? Okay, so it's, it's, it's a foot above the ground. So if I'm going somewhere, I'm not going too far. Mm -hmm. um, okay, there's a bit of patio there. Well, I won't go on that bit or I can put some blankets down and, and put the dog bed down there. Oh, there's a rose bush. Okay, I better make sure it doesn't go near the rose bush. And oh, there's some bamboo sticks sticking up. Or I'll get rid of those in case I fall and, and they go mm -hmm. in my eye. So I did this whole risk analysis far, far too in depth for what it was. Um, and the other thing that kept me going was I was videoing it and posting it on, on Twitter, posting it on social media, mm -hmm. saying, this is my progress. Look, oh, day one, I can't stand up. Day two, I can stand up for a fraction longer. Day three, day, day 20, oh, look, I've taken five steps. Um, and, and it was really nice to see that progress, but to see everyone else's comments on it as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. it was definitely, yeah. You, your legs go wobbly when you start. <laughs> same, same as you would have found on the, uh, on the, on the comedy. Oh my god! Like I, I still have that in my mind, which is why I've never actually tried tightrope walking because it terrifies <laughs> me. But now that you've said that, I think I'm going to make a point of, of trying it. But I've, I saw those videos that you posted, and I was just like amazed. It was incredible. I was like, how? <laughs> how do you do this? Yeah, so, I've, I'm still amazed. It's like no, no. I, I know that my leg just went blah, 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 at the first day, you know. <laughs> and by the, the I, mean, I still wasn't doing what I'd like to have done which was walk all the way across it turn around and come back and mm -hmm. then the weather got bad so oh yes that was another thing is uh, I had to do all stretches before I started and I had to do, make sure the grass was dry not slippy uh -huh. um, so that was also my risk analysis so obviously it's far too wet so have you had this approach of risk analyzing before you go in to do something scary is this has been like like when you did the book you just decided that you were going to write a book and you just did it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Basically, yes. For the book, I was, that was a complete ignorance um, <laughs> that took, took me through. And then it was just bloody mindedness that made me finish. <laughs> um, I was very lucky that my publishers actually kept going with it. Mm. Um, but the, the risk analysis was really only started recently. Um, I mean, going out my comfort zone is always there. It's like, okay, what can I do? But I usually find the easiest way of doing something. So the public speaking, um, I knew I wasn't that good at it. Okay, I'll join a public speaking club and they've got a, a 10 point plan of how to progress. And then you mm -hmm. just say, well, I'll, I'll go with that safety net. Um, mm -hmm. There's my safety net. I always look for my safety net of how do I, how do I get to this uncomfortable place in the safest, easiest way possible so that the only thing that I'm actually scared of is doesn't, I don't have to be. 
So an, another thing I did before lockdown, we've got a, there's a, there's a place called Clip and Climb. It's like a climbing wall for kids, um, apart from adults are allowed. <laughs> so off I go. I love that. Uh, and there's, uh, you're clipped onto the safety hot, um, belay system mm. and it's like car seatbelt. So you just have to jump off and it catches you and, and lowers you down. Yeah. Well, it took me... The, the first hour before I would trust this thing. I mean, you can see these little kids just jumping off the top, wee, and going down, no problem. I was like, yeah, I know, but I'm heavier and uh, la, la, la. And I could, could just couldn't throw myself off the top. <laughs> uh, eventually got, got around to that. And then there was another thing called um, Stairway to Heaven. So it looked like telegraph poles going up in, in, in increments in a big circle. Uh, so by the time, and, and every step is the same. So the first three or four steps, absolutely fine as if you're you know, going across uh, um, uh, stepping stones. You get to a certain height and my knees just went. No, can't do it, can't do it, can't. And then I couldn't get down. It's like, you have to jump off. It's like, no, I can't step down. I can't <laughs> jump off. And people are in the queue waiting. Or... <laughs> so, yeah, I get wobbly oh, legs. So you, you, you've essentially, not just in your career, but in your personal life and outside of that as well, you kind of have this thing of pushing yourself and, and doing the scary thing. Do you enjoy doing the scary things when your legs are wobbly in the moment of it? Are you like, oh, no. this is enjoyable. Okay. I love having done it. Yeah. Is this tweetable? Can I tweet about it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good uh, way of thinking about it, actually. And it, it's the same whenever I've done any big scary things. It's in the lead up to it or when you're in the moment of it, it can be, it's either fight or flight. You either just deal with it or you yeah. kind of, um, you're so in it in the moment that you're not even thinking about anything else or it's terrifying. It's one or the other. And you, sometimes you don't know which one it's going to be, but it's knowing that afterwards it's that satisfaction, the relief, the sense of achievement and, and growth as well that comes with it, that makes yeah. it worth it. And, um, and that gives the confidence. So things like the, the stairway to heaven has mm. given me confidence in my work stuff. Mm. Um, to gain confidence outside of work gives me the confidence inside of work um, just because I'm more comfortable with me. Mm. So where in this kind of growth of confidence and becoming you, like have, if you, can you pinpoint a time when you kind of changed and, and this new mindset came around? It's probably when I left that, that uh, relationship that I sh should have left years before <laughs> um, was, yeah, that was, I, I've got to do things differently. This mm. is wrong. I, I'm in a bad place um, and I need to do something else. Mm. And then when I was at Singularity University, uh, they were teaching you so many different things that they, it felt like my eyes had been smashed and then put together like a fly's eyes. And now I can see over there and I can see over there and I can see this and I can see that. And I can, I can see them and I'm interested in, I'm, I'm nosy, as nosy as anything. I want to see how everything works. But because, because of this, I can bring them together. And so that's uh, a lot of where I'm getting my work is that, have you taken a bit of that and a bit of that and a bit of this and then thread them together and ask that person over there um, mm. and, and then, then it'll work. Um, so both of those things, which were probably only, well, it was only 10 years ago. Um, and then in the last 10 years, I've just been throwing myself into everything mm -hmm. uh, and saying, okay, what am I doing? How do I get there? Um, have, mm -hmm. I, have I reached a plateau Am I now just churning? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm comfortable. I'm churning. I, okay, I need to do something else. I need to stretch myself again. Mm -hmm. So when you get to that place where you feel comfortable again, it's like thinking, oh, okay, do I need to continue pushing myself? Are you happy being comfortable yeah. or at this plateau for this period of time? And I, I think talking to um, many of the people who listen to this podcast I know that one of their biggest fears is that they're going to get to a point where they stagnate or they're going to go down the wrong path or they think that they need to know exactly where they're going to be in five years time even when you're 35 like even at my age I I, I freak out sometimes that I don't know what where I'm going to go but I have to remind myself that that's okay that sometimes the unknown paths are daunting but more worth it but would you say like what 
advice would you give to somebody who's worrying about stagnating or, or going down the wrong path? I'm doing bunny ears now, the wrong path. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, there is no wrong path. You gain experiences whichever path you go down. Mm. And 90% of those experiences are transferable skills. Uh, so whether you've done, you know, if you've gone into sales, but you now want to go into, I don't know, um, design, well, you still understand the customer that much better for when you're designing something for the customer. So taking the wrong path, the only wrong decision is not making a decision. Um, am I staying here because I haven't made a decision yet? Or am I staying here because I have decided to stay here? Mm. Are two different things. Mm -hmm. So that makes the decision. And the decision is never wrong. Mm. You're always going to make the right decision. You've got to follow through um, mm. and do things. And to me, well, yeah, I might be slightly different that I don't know what I'm doing in five years. Yes, that's going to be exciting, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, that comes with the safety net of having the finances that I will be okay. And now having the confidence of, I was chartered when, uh, yeah, back when I was 25 and I, I got a fellow of the IMECI about 35, 36 or something. And that gave me credibility and the PhD has given me credibility to do a lot of the things that I do into the outside world without having a big company behind me. Mm -hmm. And that has helped a lot. I know that. Uh, so I know that I'm in that privileged position mm -hmm. of having those things that, but I've had to do those things. Mm. Um, I remember a university lecturer telling me that I had to get chartered because men will say to me, you're a woman, what do you know? And you've got to be able to say, here's the piece of paper. They think I know. <laughs> um, and it's worked. It's, yeah. It really has. Wow. I, I love I love what you said about deciding making the choice of are you are you staying at work or in a job that you don't like because you want to or you've made the decision to are you doing it because you're safe and this is something that I always say to people and something that I did for many years I stayed in the company because I was too scared to comprehend the idea of leaving or doing something different and it's amazing how you can just stagnate in that fear for so long and not do anything um but that's, I think, a really powerful message to get across, actually. So if you, if you met yourself from the past when you were, I don't know, in your 30s, what would you say to yourself and what sort of advice would you give? <laughs> don't settle. <laughs> don't marry your own glass ceiling. Um, so, yeah, that, there's, there's a lot of that. Don't which we're trained, I was trained, uh, a lot of women are trained to not put ourselves first. Mm. And actually, if you do put yourselves first, you've got more to give. Mm. And that to me has, has been a, a really thing to just follow those dreams. Um, not particularly dreams, because I never really, as I never aspired to be on Robot Wars. That was um, <laughs> all a lucky coincidence of, of how it all all happened but I, I enjoyed it so there's the, the there's sometimes the giving up a job or giving up a thing not quite knowing what you're doing next just gives you that choice and it gives you the options and it gives you the breathing space to actually find new things and say yes to new things but you've got to be, bear that in mind with do you just say yes to the first thing because it's the first thing and now you're scared of nothing, um, which is actually what I did in, in shutdown was when um, a few of the conferences that I was going to talk at and what have you closed down, when other people said, oh, can you write this thing for me? Can you do this? I said, yes, 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 yes. And I have been absolutely swamped for the last year o over. Um, <laughs> I, I overdid it. Mm -hmm. So now I've just said, right, no, rest take that time out. Mm. Um, and I'm seeing all sorts of great opportunities and thinking, oh, I can pick and choose now. Mm. That's a brilliant position to be in, mm. actually. And, and you're so right about not, not looking after yourself <laughs> is, a, is definitely a thing. And I think as women, I don't know if you find this, I know I do and some of my friends do, it's this need to apologize or put other people first in the self-sacrifice constantly or 
or feeling guilty. And some of my friends who now have children, they feel guilty if they decide to um, do something for them rather than for their kids. And it's this kind of balance. And um, I'm sure with your dog as well, sometimes if you, if you're going away and leaving your dog for a long period of time or something like that. Yep. Yep. Plenty. Yeah. I still get it. I still, I still feel. Oh, I can't. I couldn't possibly do that because who'd look after the dog as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dog sitters. Um, how how do you keep that balance? Sorry, that balance between kind of yourself and you time, and then the work and your job. And how do you distinguish between? Obviously, as as you are your business in a way. So how do you differentiate between the two? so that you can kind of let go. I don't. (laughs) I I don't differentiate. Mainly because everything that I do that's fun, for Mm -hmm. fun, I will probably then put on social media. It will then spread. My name will will spread and therefore my name will get known. And so if someone wants someone to do something fun Mm -hmm. and engineering, uh, someone may recommend me. So, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it wasn't planned that way. That's just how it, I, I went on social media to uh, push my book. And uh, now no one knows that I've written a book. So that, you know, that didn't work very well <laughs> at all. Um, but there's the, yeah, j- just, I haven't got that boundary. Mm. And for the way my life works, that's absolutely fine. Because I've always put on social media, only the positive, mm. um, unless I'm slating some company for not work, not working properly. Um, so yeah, I'm, I always look for the positive, but I try and do that in life. And mm-hmm. I try and just focus on the positive of things. Um, and I, I do realize that, yeah, okay, I need to, um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't spoken to someone. I'd, I'd spoken to people on Zoom calls, but I actually hadn't spoken to someone in real life for far too long. So I booked my friend and we went for a walk. And so mm-hmm. actually I need this. Um, I need to talk to friends about their stuff, about other stuff, about not work-related stuff. Mm. So I, I do realize it's there. Um, and mm. sometimes I forget that actually, oh, I'm human too. Oh, I'm not a robot. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I'd I better do some of that social stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, rather than diving into your work all the time. But then yeah. I guess it, it makes it more human because you're right in that if you're doing something fun and then you let people know about it as well, then people can connect with you more. So do you feel that um, doing this, talking to people as well about your hobbies and keeping it not just in terms of work, does that help bring you more business later on and more gigs and more work? I, I believe it does. I mean, no one really says, oh, I saw you on Twitter doing Slackline and can you come and talk <laughs> about <laughs> communication <laughs> skills? So, yeah, it doesn't happen quite that way. Um, but, you know, um, you have a large reach on Twitter. Can you talk to us yeah. has, uh, or talk with us has worked? Um, mm. but the, yeah. I just put up what I find is fun. Fortunately, mm. other people find it fun too. They do. I, I love following you on Twitter, to be honest. <laughs> I don't pay, I, I, I just go on Twitter mainly to read other people's things and you're definitely one of my yeah, favorite you're a, people. You're a lurker. <laughs> I am a lurker. I'm more Instagram and video. I haven't quite figured out Twitter yet. I need to. I find it quite fast and I feel like I need to be on it all the time. And then I, I find it very distracting. How do, you, how do you manage that? Do you just go on at certain periods of the day? Usually when I'm procrastinating, <laughs> um, I, will, I will go on. And um, I will only read the last few minutes worth mm. I mean I'm following a lot of people so I don't I don't search through and I don't go back to all of them I mean I remember when I started on Twitter 10 years ago I was going back and reading everything that I hadn't read mm. um, yeah that doesn't work for me I work on the principle that if it was good someone will repeat it or retweet it mm. um, so yeah I just take it as it comes um, yeah if I'm if I need a cuppa, I'll just tweet out. Anyone want a cuppa? You know, if I want some company, mm-hmm. <laughs> anyone want a cuppa? Um, and then, then I get some responses. Um, yeah, but I, I was off Twitter for, I took the whole of February off mm-hmm. uh, because I realized that actually I had an awful lot of work still to do. Um, and, and I was spending too long on it. Um, mm-hmm. Getting that 
in, like getting that endorphin hit of who's liked it? Who's, who's, who's favorited what I've just said? Who thinks I'm wonderful? Who's giving me the pat on the head? Like, no, actually, you, you can give yourself a pat on the head, Lucy. It's absolutely fine. You don't need to <laughs> wait for everyone else to give you a pat on the head. And actually, that's something that I probably would have told a younger me is mm. pat yourself on the head. You don't need to rely on someone else to do it. Mm. Um, it's nice when they do, but don't go searching it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ce- celebrating your own wins as well. Um, do you celebrate yeah. yourself? Do you, I don't know if you, I, I occasionally have champagne Fridays if, if something <laughs> happens, even if it's small, I'll have a champagne Friday <laughs> because why not? Um, I, I've just set on, set up on a, a t- set myself a 10 week intense training program for something. And I, I do the Sunday look back. How far have I come? Oh, yes, I did that. Oh, I rock. Um, I, I don't go as far as champagne, but maybe I should. If you're tra- <laughs> what are you training for? Um, I'm, I'm trying to get fit again um, mm-hmm. and also learning German. So, oh, cool. so it was a double, double thing. Again, languages was one of those things I can't do. I can't, mm. I don't do languages. I didn't do very well in my GCSEs. I don't do languages. So now I've uh, gone the easy route again and I've got an online course um, yeah. with a tutor um, you know, who answers various things. So, but it's mainly online. So it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're essentially going back like with the electronics as well, how you, you went back and you learned electronics. So you're plugging the gaps of the things that you said that you're scared of or not so good at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, fortunately I'm a generalist. Um, if, if someone said you can only focus on one thing forever, I'd think I'd, I'd go nuts. <sighs> I think many people are like that though. There's this term called multi-passionate where you have so many passions um, rather rather than there's people at school that I met who were like, I want to be a vet for the rest of my life. I was never one of those people. And it sounds like you're not either. (laughs) No, no. uh, But mainly in our companies uh, and uh, in our lives that we want specialists Mm-hmm. We only want specialists and generalists, you know, jack of all trade. Well, you're a master of none then, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, how do you manage that then? I managed to find, well, one, I managed to find places that do want a generalist. Mm-hmm. And two, some of the work that I find, I go to places where they're not engineers. And so in a, in a room full of non-engineers, I'm the best engineer there is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can stand out that way. Um, and, you know, so some of my projects that I've done, I, I did something for a, a comedy band and they had a, a concertina, a squeeze box, a musical instrument, mm-hmm. and he wanted to play it in the background. Um, but when he did a really long note, he wanted to pull it apart and it to fall apart. Um, so yeah, I made that for him. And then I wrote it up for somewhere else. And it was the somewhere else that paid me to write it up mm-hmm. uh, for Design Spark, for RS Components Design Spark. Um, so the, the comedy band wouldn't have been able to afford my time mm-hmm. to, to make it. But it was like, yeah, I put myself in a situation where I'm not with other engineers and then find problems that I can solve mm-hmm. and then come back. And then it's, and because you're in a place that's not, full of engineers, they don't know what the specialists are. They don't know what they know. I need a, someone who can do exactly this one thing. It's like, well, <laughs> I can probably, and I know a lot of specialists. That also helps. Um, and as I said, I ask for help a lot, mm-hmm. uh, which is why a lot of my stuff gets written up as open source stuff. It's like, well, I borrowed this information from there and I borrowed this information and that person wrote me some code. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I put it all together and here's the thing. So you can do it too. Wow. See, that's, that's highly strategic then. So you're, you've pla- you're placing yourself and you're going after, yeah, the right type of people, which is yeah. very, very clever. And I'm not surprised <laughs> that that's your approach either. <laughs> so to, I mean, I've, I've absolutely loved this and I could carry on asking you questions and talk to you for ages, I think. But um, to finish off, um, I would absolutely love to know what, would, what is fulfillment and success to you in terms of your career? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm, a go- I'm a goal 
setter and a badge collector. So when I was a girl guide, I, I had 43 badges or something, you know, and I got the best badge that you could. Mm. And I, sadly to me, I think, I think it's sad. I'm still like that. And I've recently been um, nominated and awarded the fellowship of the Royal Academy of Engineering, which to me um, is, it's the best badge in the UK for engineers yeah. um, given to individuals. And I didn't actually fit their boxes. Um, when I looked at the requirements, they again wanted specialists. So when I was, uh, when someone nominated, they said, well, you know, which, which box do you fit in? I said, I'm a Lucy shaped box. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they must have looked at the application or the, uh, the nomination and, and made a Lucy shaped box for me, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So that has given me a huge buzz that not only have I managed to get to that stage and been mm. recognized by my peers but also I've broken some boundaries or broken some glass ceilings or, or whatever it is mm. and other people who've had non-traditional careers excuse me <clears throat> other people who've had non-traditional careers can then hopefully find it easier so that's given me that buzz as well so I've got two buzzes going on personally and professionally yeah. um, but the other buzzes is have I solved a problem? Can I solve a problem that someone else can't solve? It's mm. like, yes, yes, I've done it. Yeah, that gives me a buzz. This is oh, this is incredible. And and it's the the fact that you've paved the way for people as well. Like me, who I have a weird background too, <laughs> weird alternative. So <laughs> it we need more of this. We need, especially in some of these um, engineering institutions where it is very traditional and we need um, women to stand up like like you and to change things and pave the way for us to make to make the path easier for us as well. <laughs> so, so uh, it's definitely appreciated. And the fact that your success and your fulfillment is essentially the buzz that you can get. It's not necessarily about um, recognition, although I guess badges are a bit of recognition. But yeah. really, it's more about as you said, smashing those glass ceilings and seeing what you can do and what you're yeah. capable of. Yeah. The, the, the finding out, oh, no, I can do that. That, mm. that does it for me. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not financially motivated, mm. um, yeah, which is probably useful in the kind of career <laughs> I, I want. <laughs> Yeah, mate. But then I, I have a feeling and I, I feel like I know that if you were and you didn't have it, you would still create this path for yourself. There would still be ways and there are ways to to make money doing yeah. the things that you want as well. Yes, I think, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And being an engineer and a creative and a problem solver, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure you would make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I won't be just eating beans. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for your time and for joining. I know that I've learned a lot and it's amazing to kind of hear and it's almost makes it human to and it's very grounding as well to know that you know it, you didn't have everything sussed out from the beginning. You've kind Not of gone with the flow and that's been okay. <laughs> yeah, it's worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anywhere that people can find you or anything that you would love to talk about? Um, I'm, I'm mainly on Twitter at Dr. Lucy Rogers, mm -hmm. um, but I've um, also got my own website, lucyrogers.com. Mm -hmm. So for any speaking gigs or anything else, then yes, book Lucy, yep. definitely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> find me there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lucy. And uh, hopefully I'll get to speak to you again soon. <laughs> no problem. It's been Cheers. good. Thanks. Bye.